Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ford Presidential Library. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my privilege to serve as the director of the library here in Ann Arbor and the museum in Grand Rapids. We're very pleased to have you with us tonight for our second speaker program of the new year. 2013 is the centennial year of President Ford's birth, so we're planning a number of special programs, and you'll want to stand by for more announcements of those at the end of the program. Tonight's program is one of my favorite features of our annual planning because it features the winner of the Ford Presidential Award for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency. There are two journalism awards that are given, one for reporting on national defense and the other on the presidency. This award has been given annually for 24 years at a June event at the National Press Club in Washington. While the stipend for the award comes from the Ford Presidential Foundation, the selection of the winner is made by an independent panel of journalists and journalism faculty. And I've been told by several prior winners that they view this as the Academy Award of Journalism. And so this is kind of good timing for that, for that event. In winning the 2011 prize for reporting on the presidency, Scott Wilson joins the distinguished company of several prior winners, including Peter Baker of the New York Times, Bob Woodward, also of the Washington Post, Michael Isikoff of Newsweek, Michael Duffy of Time, and Jackie Collins from the Wall Street Journal. That's pretty nice company to be in, I think. Mr. Wilson is a native of Santa Barbara, California, a graduate of Amherst College, and then the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. He joined the staff of the Washington Post in 1997 and is currently White House correspondent for that publication. Previously, he's done quite a bit of international work, serving as Deputy Assistant Manager for Foreign News, Jerusalem Bureau Chief for three years, Middle East Correspondent based in Amman, Jordan, and Andean Bureau Chief based in Bogota, Colombia. He has received numerous awards for his work from the Overseas Press Club and also the Inter-American Press Association, and in 2012 received the Beckman Award from the White House Correspondents Association. When he was, received the award in 2012 for the, the Ford Prize, the judges stated that while the current challenges in covering the presidency encourage conformity, Scott Wilson stands out as being a nonconformist, bringing his readers on the style analysis of the White House activity that is not available anywhere else. He reports on both what the president does and, more importantly, sometimes on what the president doesn't do. They went on to say he is Ill, able to write critically without being offensive or partisan. He reaches out broadly to sources both inside the White House and beyond, <laughs> yielding an even-handed perspective on the performance and the results of the Obama presidency. And he has covered the entire first term of President Obama as well as now the second term. Please join me in welcoming a most interesting person, and I'm glad you're here for what will be a most interesting evening, Scott Wilson. Thank you all so much for having me. Uh, just to be clear, I'm a writer, not a speaker, generally. So I'll do my very best, but bear with me as I, as I uh, make some remarks and then hope to have a, a lot of fun with um, some questions I hope it, it provokes. Um, thank you so much for having me, Elaine. Um, and again, for the extraordinary honor of awarding me the Gerald R. Ford Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency. Um, it was a milestone moment uh, for me and my family who joined me at last year's awards lunch, uh, and not only because of the school my three kids missed that day, which was <laughs> thrilling. Uh, I also had a great time this afternoon touring the uh, Ford Presidential Library. It's my first time in, in Ann Arbor. Uh, so thanks so much to Ken and Mark who guided me through. Um, truly for the award and this opportunity to the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation and to the gracious Ford family, thank you. To begin, I want to take you back briefly to the 2008 presidential election when many American voters felt a sense of historic excitement at the possibility of electing the nation's first African-American president. But there was something else going on besides the once unimaginable integration of America's highest office. And it had to do with how then Senator Obama and his advisors communicated with the young, increasingly diverse block of voters that will likely decide elections for years to come. With only a few months left in the race, one senior Obama campaign official noted pointedly and publicly that his candidate would win 
without ever having spoken to the editorial board of the Washington Post. The embodiment of the inside the Beltway media that was becoming to the young Obamaites as obsolete as a telex machine. And of course, Obama did. With that perspective in mind, I'd like to speak tonight simply about what it is like to cover the White House in the age of President Obama, a uniquely savvy communicator who has, who has at his disposal a wider array of tools to achieve a political goal that unites even Republicans and Democrats, avoiding as much as possible the national media. <laughs> the president and his advisors deploy official websites, Twitter accounts, YouTube, Google Plus Hangouts to speak directly to the American people, a not ignoble goal in itself. The result? A message often delivered free of the traditionally rigorous scrutiny applied by news organizations such as mine. I'll outline the broad scope of the change in the field of presidential and campaign communications in just the four years I've been observing it and how those changes have been applied to governing the country in a way that increasingly leaves traditional media on the margins of the national political conversation. Perhaps the biggest challenge facing me tonight? To do this in a way that doesn't sound like the prolonged, unbecoming whine of a 46-year-old man who has spent more than half his life writing for a medium that represented the cutting edge of communication more than a century ago. That won't be easy at a personal level. But on a broad scale, why shouldn't the extremely low barriers to entry that the internet represents for startup journalism signal the next golden age of communication and accountability reporting? Why wouldn't more eyes and more iPhone video trained on our government be anything other than a healthy development for our democracy? The truth is, it is just that, a boom time at a moment in journalism redefined by technology. It's a message I deliver to every young journalist I talk to. You will be asked to be more versatile, more enterprising, and less averse to risk than my generation of dues paying up through the ranks reporters who moved slowly from newspaper to newspaper. But the opportunities are many more than when I started out. But here's what worries me. It's not so much the nature of journalism today as it is the increasing ability of the government, for our purposes tonight, the White House, to avoid the well-reported analysis and appraisal of the independent media, regardless of its brand or the manner in which it is delivered, whether by paper route or streaming video. Radio, then television, may have been the first great leaps in a president's ability to reach the public without speaking through a reporter. But there, was a net, but there was network time to secure, radio stations to lobby in order for, for your news conference to be carried. No more. The internet is everyone's, and no president has embraced this ethos quite like Barack Obama. Add to that the proliferation of social media tools I mentioned, and you have, in President Obama, an administration increasingly able to simply cover itself. Take two weeks ago. In a quaint nod to what once was, President Obama called his appearance on Google Plus a, quote, fireside hangout, <laughs> a face-to-face -face online chat between president and public that even FDR may not have imagined possible. I began covering the administration a month after Obama took his first oath of office. I have spent most of my 15-year career at the Post overseas as a correspondent in Latin America and in the Middle East. My perspective, learned in Colombia and in Haiti, in Iraq and in Israel, is that America is able to shape events in distant places, but often to a far smaller degree than it believes it can. Its ambitions outstripping its abilities, military intervention excluded. Mine was an extreme outside perspective to bring to the White House assignment and to a changing post newsroom, then shrinking its outside the Beltway national coverage and increasingly viewing the new administration as the center of gravity of nearly every developing story. This was partly driven by money concerns and partly by the shrinking place in the crowded media market where the Post, as a primary source of Washington reporting, could still thrive. I didn't cover the 2008 election, having returned at the beginning of that year from Jerusalem to serve as the deputy foreign editor. Even from that vantage, it was clear that not only was the Democratic nominee historic in his biography, but so too was the campaign he was running 
which pointed towards something new in the way the government and governed might soon be able to communicate without any barriers between them. Using its single website and mass email list to raise money and excite voters, the candidate Obama embraced the internet as an extension of his on the trail activities as no one had before. And yet, with the hindsight of today's communication advances, it was still rudimentary. The campaign operated a single Twitter account, for example, which sent out a sum total of two messages, both on election day, to encourage supporters to get to the polls. The election was celebrated as the moment when technology changed forever the way campaigns were conducted and covered, and it was. But even in those self-congratulatory self times, it would have been hard even for Obama's team to predict the new media leap that would take place before he faced voters again. By the 2012 cycle, Obama's re-election effort operated the most advanced and multi-layered new media operation in campaign history, with a team of in-house computer programmers, video producers, dozens of Twitter accounts, and a database so refined with marketing information that campaign strategists, strategists knew not just who in a neighborhood could be persuaded to support the president, but who in a given household was undecided but gettable. From the ceiling of the suite occupied by the Obama campaign headquarters in Chicago's Prudential Plaza building, printed signs designated the different areas of operation across the vast room. Obama data, surrogates, video team. Those placards floated above the rows of mostly young men and women toiling at their laptops. Keep calm and carry on, recalling the days of London's Blitz, reminded them of the war they were in and the way it would be fought through a new alchemy of marketing data, voting patterns and demography, and in cyber tranquility as much as possible. At one point, the campaign boasted 700 paid staff. As an aging journalist from the so-called legacy media, my first alarmed reaction when I entered the headquarters in the early spring of 2012 was, wow, there's a whole national campaign underway that we know next to nothing about. And I was right about that. As one senior campaign official involved in the messaging and marketing side of the operations told me a month before election day, the conversation we have been having with voters is much different than the one that the national media have been having with voters. The not so veiled message, the people who matter most to us are not moved by what you in the national media find important. This campaign to, vote, this campaign to voter conversation was carried out through directed blogs and targeted email guided by Google data collection and by Twitter accounts that had flourished since 2008. Campaign officials described three, four, and even five news cycles a day. Not the one that began with the morning newspaper and ended with the evening news as it did during the Ford administration. And it was being driven, shaped, and flamed by campaign staff Twitter accounts. Uh, it's a great way, one senior communications advisor told me, to get inside the other campaign's head. That is, to irritate the other guys to distraction. At least when it came to this tactic, Mitt Romney had his own pros on the case as well. As of this week, the president has more than 27 million followers on Twitter. Not all, but the vast majority of them supporters. Why again would Obama risk an interview with a place like The Post when he has an audience of that size at his disposal? The legacy media no longer mattered, or at least not nearly to the degree that they once did in determining the trajectory of a national political contest. Much of the direct communication appealed to the young voters who comprise Obama's political base. How to make an incumbent president as appealing as the inspiring newcomer he was in 2008? By constant conversation with supporters through highly targeted email, campaign-produced video documentaries, and testimonials, and a message to share with a friend through social media the argument to vote for Obama. Obama won the youth vote by a margin of 67 to 30% in 2012. And in a year supposed, of supposedly low enthusiasm, more young voters turned out to vote than did four years earlier by a significant amount. In swing states, yes, the Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the networks had the potential to matter more. Persuasion became as important as turnout. But in those states, Obama and his advisors chose to speak most 
to the local television stations and newspapers, staffed by fine journalists, certainly, but whose interests tended naturally toward parochial policy. That fit nicely with what Obama, as president and candidate, wanted to talk about in those contested states anyway, rather than the attacks in Benghazi, Libya, the stalled Middle East peace process, the mounting federal debt, whatever issue of national importance of the day. In other words, more than any of the politically fraught subjects that preoccupied the traveling press. During one stretch in 2010, Obama went more than nine months without holding a formal news conference with the National Press Corps, a routine give and take that, if often irksome, John Kennedy engaged in nearly every week. There was simply little need to talk through Washington's filter, the word most often used to describe the national media by senior White House communication officials. The lessons of the election success, both in 20, uh, 2008 and in its more perfected form in 2012, were clear to the men and women who devised Obama's communication strategy. If it could work on the campaign trail, why wouldn't a similar approach work in governing the country? The White House communications operation adopted the tools and messaging operation of the campaign. It organized within the White House a new media team, in-house video producers, platforms for pro-administration bloggers, live streams of events, all through the once rudimentary whitehouse.gov website. Then there are the stunning, often poignant, behind the scenes images, images shot by the talented White House staff photographer, Pete Souza, who administration officials increasingly argue to independent photojournalists is an acceptable proxy, even if he is paid by the administration itself. Running a White House released photo on our website or in the newspaper would have been unheard of just a few years ago, or at least a point of intense internal debate, given the clear, line, clear distinction the Post maintains between our own independent journalism and material produced by the people we cover, particularly the White House. Now it is almost commonplace, at least on our website. As Robert Gibbs, who served as Obama's first White House press secre secretary, told my colleague Chris Eliza, when these eight years are done, Pete will be its most important illustrator. Obama became the first president to put his weekly quote unquote radio address on YouTube. The official White House channel, as it is called, has nearly 300,000 subscribers. And so far, the live streams and videos it produces have been viewed nearly 121 million times. Obama has also conducted quote unquote news conferences with the public entirely through Twitter, a challenge for an occasionally loquacious former law lecturer who once gave a 16-minute answer during a North Carolina town hall forum. <laughs> I'll try not to follow suit when we get to your questions soon. <laughs> At one of his daily briefings last month, White House Press Secretary Jay Carney was asked about the administration's real-time analysis of the president's second inaugural address, which arrived as a relentless series of tweets. As you know, this administration did not and probably would not have set the 140 character limit to tweet, he said to laughter. So when the new media office tweets on a speech, we do it in increments. I just wanna highlight new media team in that quote, not something I'd guess President Ford had at his disposal. The new media team not only designs, but also directs what new media Obama does. Earlier this month, as I mentioned, Obama participated in a Google fireside hangout where he responded to questions from the public who signed in through the web portal. To one participant, he stated, this is the most transparent administration in history. And by the measure of direct engagement with the public, when he is often able to make claims left unexamined in real time by independent media, that most certainly is true. And last week, supporters drawn from his Organizing for Action campaign database this is his campaign uh, organization that has been transformed now, mobilized on behalf of his uh, legislative agenda. Uh, they were invited to watch a quote unquote enhanced State of the Union address through whitehouse.gov. Those who turned in were treated to pop-up charts, graphs, and pro-administration arguments that appeared whenever Obama made a new policy proposal, which he did many times in the hour-long speech. Within hours, those same supporters received an email from David Seamus, a former senior campaign official who is now one of the president's chief communications advisors. The subject line, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Seamus wrote that Obama in the address, quote, was talking to Congress, but there's someone he especially wanted to speak to, you. 
He continued, that's why we created Citizens Response, a new tool that lets you tell President Obama and his advisors what you thought of his plan. The Post live blogged the speech with our own beat writers, something that we're all growing accustomed to also, uh, and evaluated the proposals in real time as best we could. I wrote the main story for the next day's front page detailing the speech and the president's intentions. Several other political journalists at the Post wrote smart, independent analyses for the paper. But here's what the White House's enhanced speech, uh, enhanced speech offer to supporters and the how do we do follow-up revealed most clearly. Our competition is no longer the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or Politico. It is just as much the White House itself. Jay Carney was a successful Washington journalist, the Time Magazine bureau chief, who covered the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations. In 2003, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation honored Mr. Carney with the award I was fortunate enough to win last year. He has, in short, seen the circus from both sides, and I spoke with him earlier this week for some perspective on the changes that I could share with you. For one, Mr. Carney bristles a bit at the notion this administration has sought too often to go around the national media. He cited 674 interviews President Obama has given since taking office, more than 100 of them to major media outlets, primarily television networks. Even those, though, now feature on staff, quote unquote, political analysts who are unabashed proxies for the administration. The NBC News decision this week to hire David Axelrod who helped engineer President Obama's election victories as a senior political analyst illustrates not just a blurring, but an erasing of lines between an independent press and the White House media operation. Many of the interviews Obama has given are with local and regional news organizations. And as I noted earlier, these are journalists no less able than the White House press corps, just interested generally in using a rare 10 minutes with the president on national issues of particular local importance to their markets. Just yesterday, President Obama sat for interviews with local TV anchors from eight states, some located where his immigration proposals are important, others where energy and climate change issues resonate. The back-to-back -back chats were labeled, quote, live from the White House by the Administration Communications Department. What Mr. Carney does not dispute is how quickly the media landscape has changed and how much more challenging that makes writing about a presidency. When he began covering the Clinton administration, he noted, CNN was a novel concept, a 24-hour news channel. As he took his job in 2011 as press secretary, ascending from communications director for Vice President Biden, Mr. Carney spoke with his predecessors about the rhythms of the job. The message he, he told me he heard, quote, it used to be, and not that long ago, we would watch the evening news, check in with the major daily newspapers to see what they were working on, and that was it. A single daily news cycle, a few big deal newspapers, and television stations to worry about. How, White House media, how the White House media world has changed. To a far more egalitarian, size doesn't matter, but the demographics of your audience does kind of way. As a citizen, Mr. Carney told me, my concern is less with how many interviews an outlet gets with the president. My concern is how to get quality reporting to policymakers and citizens. And he added, part of the challenge in this is the viability of expensive news organizations. He didn't, perhaps out of politeness, mention my own. <laughs> Presidential interviews are one measure, and perhaps really the wrong measure, to judge accessibility and transparency. The president's time, as Mr. Carney reminded me in our talk, is by far the administration's most valuable commodity and the one his advisors think most about how to use effectively, both in governing and in communicating with the country. I interviewed President Obama in the Oval Office in December 2009. And that, other than the occasional appearance on Air Force One, including a brief one on the way back from his now famous Florida golf outing this week, and a small off-the-record lunch or two with the President and a handful of other White House reporters, that really has been it for me. It is not much time to get to know a figure I spend the majority of my professional time and many non-professional hours, just ask my wife, thinking about how to explain, understand, measure historically, and set into some kind of political context for readers. And here's the peculiar, as luck would have it way, the interview came about anyway, the kind of limited trick of the trade that can be used, as the title of this talk suggests, to chisel a small crack now and then 
in the White House's increasingly thick cement walls. President Obama's first chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, is famous for his garrulous relationship with many reporters. And although I had never met him personally, um, I had spent his congressional years overseas, uh, we spoke very often once I began the White House assignment. Our relationship was very useful, as source reporter relationships go, and at times very contentious. He called with complaints as often as he called with what he phrased ideas. <laughs> After checking in very late one night on a story I'd running in the next day's paper that he had been aware was in the works, I told him that he'd, quote, likely be underwhelmed, unquote, by how little I'd been able to find out from another government agency that was challenging the White House on the direction of a certain national security policy. Don't worry, he told me. I'm always underwhelmed by your work. <laughs> one Saturday afternoon, my phone rang, and it was Rom with an idea about how to consider what he presented as the president's early success in resetting poor relations with Russia. The dots he was connecting sketched what seemed to me to be a premature assessment at best and an overly rosy one at worst. I told him I'd think about it. The next morning, reading the New York Times, I saw deep in a very good story about another element of President Obama's foreign policy, words from a, quote, senior administration official that were precisely the same ones I'd heard from Rahm a day earlier. I dialed his number and in feigned outrage told him I thought our talk was exclusive, that my editors were furious with me, and that I just wasn't sure how to proceed. This, to put it mildly, was an exaggeration, given that I hadn't talked to my editors, who I'm not even sure noticed the story at all. <laughs> but Rahm, who was tough as nails at times and not such a tough guy at others, said, OK, how about if I get you 20 minutes with the president this week on his legislative agenda? I said that, indeed, would help mend some fences that, <laughs> between us, I believe he and I both knew weren't actually damaged. <laughs> Two days later, I was in the Oval Office where the president outlined his successes, the challenges ahead in securing health care legislation, and what, in general terms, he had learned about compromise in his first full year in office. The story led the paper and broke a bit of news. Of course, it doesn't usually work that way. There's a communications committee that weighs these many interview requests. And print media, even with websites that can carry video and transcripts such as ours, are not the ones of choice for a modern White House. Most of my job, though, is identifying and cultivating through frequent contact, honesty in my published work, and a sense of expertise in the subjects of the day, the officials who make and execute policy beneath the presidential level. The Post is also one of the few media organizations that still invests in traveling on every presidential trip. And having been along from Cairo to Columbus, Jakarta to Asheville, North Carolina, where I was with Obama just last week, has helped me find the kinds of inside administration guides invaluable to creating original reporting on such a closed beat. But not enough, never enough. Each administration, according to colleagues who have covered many of them, tightens the lid on information a bit further, and the policymaking process and power is extremely concentrated in this White House. To get even a glimpse inside this highly disciplined West Wing, developing a reliable network of experts, lawmakers and lobbyists, foreign diplomats, officials from other government agencies, and the rest of the villagers who populate a political Washington now commonly referred to as the town is even more valuable. A drop of information from outside the White House on what is happening inside the administration can sometimes be just enough to get a senior official to return a phone call, to confirm, deny, explain, or just sigh. And that happens most of all when Washington's bureaucracies have interests under threat. Think of the rich reporting veins mined during the Afghanistan strategy review when the White House, the Pentagon, the State Department, and other agencies all had different ideas for what should happen with the war. This is a Washington reporter's dream scenario, and, it ha and, it, and it's one that appears less and less frequently uh, with this highly disciplined administration able to communicate with the public directly uh, as ably as it is. This administration has made those outside sources of information even more important, and especially in the first term, hard to come by. President Obama took office as a relative newcomer to Washington without the vast political network in this town that usually accrues to those on the long slog upward, the kind, frankly, that Vice President Biden or Hillary Rodham Clinton were more able to draw on. Obama is a private person, 
avoids the after hours phone calls that used to keep Bill Clinton going past midnight to lobby lawmakers, and is the first president who makes frequent use of his own internet browser. Early on, it was harder than it has been in previous administrations to find people outside the White House who knew Obama well or could crack his small coterie of advisors, many of them loyalist veterans of the long shot 2008 campaign. The president famously has dinner each night with his young daughters, sometimes returning afterward to the West Wing for work, often remaining alone with his internet browser, his briefing book that by all accounts he devours each evening and fills with marginalia, and the occasional Sports Center recap before bed. Here's how I put it in a 2011 essay I wrote for our Outlook section. Obama is a political loner who prefers policy over the people who make politics work in this country. He likes politics, said a Washington veteran who supports Obama, but like a campaign manager, likes politics, not like a candidate. The former draws energy from science and strategy, the latter from contact with people which raises an odd question. Is it possible to be America's most popular politician and not be very good at American politics? By that I meant the inside game of Washington, the one he staffs his inner circle to win, the one more immune to the means of communication his administration employs to speak beyond the beltway. Those are the officials to know. But they, al they are also extremely busy people, Late dinners are the only meals you can schedule since lunch is commonly eaten at desks, and they operate under the scrutiny of a highly disciplined communications team that does not like leaks and has been known to hunt down those who make them, not to mention to take legal action against reporters who refuse to give up sources on matters of national security. This is, at the same time it should be noted, an administration that ordered government cooperation with the director and screenwriters making the Hollywood hit Zero Dark Thirty a mythologized version of Obama's signature counterterrorism success, the killing of Osama bin Laden. The nature of a scoop today is also different than it once was, given the near instantaneous ability to publish. I've benefited over the years from an hour's early heads up on the president's decision in 2011 to remove all U.S. forces from Iraq, from a day early tip on how the president will use human rights in his meetings with Chinese leader Hu Jintao on the impending decision that the White House would be returning an ambassador to Syria after years away from Damascus. This is before the recent uh, civil war. And from an early look at a new human rights initiative to target Syrian and Iranian officials who use technology to hunt down rebels and dissidents. But those kinds of scoops often last only long enough for a publication to match a story and post it on its website, giving credit where credit's due. So where is the value of the Washington Post and similar publications? The kind that engage in sometimes prolonged, often very expensive, news gathering operations to cover the White House and the rest of the world. It is increasingly in the rigor and quality of that reporting, of speaking regularly to those five or six West Wing officials who really know what's going on, of collecting documents and data, and then analyzing as precisely and clearly as possible what it all adds up to for readers bombarded by bits and pieces of information delivered in tweets, iPhone video, and other new instruments on the internet. That is our niche. It is a tenuous one, and it grows even more so when the U.S. government, our franchise target at the Washington Post, is increasingly able to cover itself in a way that the administration's supporters in particular find even more satisfying than when it is done independently by others. So let's uh, have some questions about that. Thank you. Well, I, uh, I don't doubt a word of what you've said about your own experience. I do feel, however, it lacked considerably in historical perspective, that you parachuted in from the Andes and you found yourself <laughs> there with very little knowledge of how George W. Bush manipulated the media. Uh, boy, you go back to Ronald Reagan, and I cannot quite remember the name of his PR guy who would spend days in front of the Statue of Liberty deciding just where to position the president so the wind would be blowing and the flags would be waving mm -hmm. and create these patriotic images. I think of the direct mail, which was the a much earlier version of some of these tweets that were in fact 
uh, largely developed uh, on the Republican mm -hmm. side. I think, in fact, most of these techniques, other than the new media, uh, were perfected under Republican administrations. Uh, you know, you, you, we should compare how many news conferences of various sorts President Obama had in his first term as against how many uh, George W. Bush had. And the numbers, I think, are quite small, <laughs> probably deplorably small, but uh, still quite comparable. So I, I wish you would, you know, look a little bit more into what some of the president's predecessors had done to manipulate the media. I, I appreciate the question. I, uh, my point, and I hope, like, maybe I didn't make it clear enough, is not about presidents manipulating the media. That's, that's ageless and not unique to the United States. The, the, the point is no president has ever had the ability to, the, the tools at their disposal to do the things that they do now. Um, and let's take, the, let's take the Reagan imagery. Uh, and uh, who needed, who, where, how was that carried? Who, who covered that? My, my colleagues David Hoffman and Lou Cannon, who both won the Ford Award, covered that presidency. The Washington Post, if the Washington Post weren't there that day writing about it, along with a handful of others, uh, that image doesn't get out. Now, now, now it gets out, it gets out instantaneously from uh, from the White House, uh, from Pete Sousa. Uh, the White House, we may actually not even be invited to cover that event. That may be a pool-only event where only three or four reporters are allowed. Um, the, the, uh, the extraordinary uh, um, uh, array, the ability, the power to, to, to do some of the things that you um, uh, completely accurately described uh, have never been greater than they are right now. Um, and I would just uh, spend, uh, you, you probably don't have a, a lot of time for this, but spend some time just, just perusing the, just the White House website alone and the Organizing for Action website alone. Uh, go back and look a little bit at the campaign, uh, in the in-house, no president has had the kind of in-house computer programming uh, and production uh, video uh, capabilities. Um, and I mean, these are multi, multi-million dollar operations, much, much now funded by taxpayers. Um, so I, I certainly take your larger point that President Obama is not the first one to want to make the public uh, see him in his best light. Uh, my point is that I think inarguably uh, the, uh, the possibilities that, that social media has opened up to presidents um, allows this, uh, and, and this end run around the media, to occur in ways that, it, that it's, never, it's never occurred before. But I, but I certainly see your point. I would just mention the name, for example, of David Hume Kennerly, that wonderful name, who was President Ford's White House photographer, and I suspect the, the, the Post among other, other newspapers, carried a lot of his pictures, too. I, I, would, I would argue that. Uh, the, part of the problem is photographers are not allowed, are not invited into nearly as many events as we used to be. Um, and Pete's photographs are wonderful. But, but, but I understand your point, and I, I probably should have made that in a fuller way, that, that the idea of, of, of attempting to reach directly and shape the public's perception of the president is, is certainly not a new thing. Um, it's just that, that, that what this president has at his disposal um, is, is new and growing every day, truthfully. Thank you. Your presentation reminded me, and I'm sure others in here, of the uh, author and presentation we heard, the Victory Lab. Uh, that comprehensively covered what Obama did in 2008. As an aside, I, I'm curious on your take on this whole golfing with Tiger Woods and the level of access. But, but a more important question, maybe I'm kind of cheating getting two in here. You obviously use um, anonymous sources, highly placed White House officials. Do you have somewhat of a fixed policy on that in the sense how many confirmations, other confirmations do you need? And you shared somewhat an example of, of how you were helped by that kind of access, were you ever burned by the use of anonymous sources and, and would be interested in that? Uh, all good questions. Let me start with the, the Tiger Woods episode, which I was along 
for the ride on too, so I can speak firsthand on that. Um, uh, generally, um, as a logistical matter, there's always about a dozen reporters that travel with the president. This is called the traveling pool, the press pool. Uh, we, whoever serves it, it's a rot it happens on a rotating basis who serves in it. And we represent, we file out our pool reports that are then used by any media uh, that wants to. They don't have to quote us. It's, it's their material. We're their representatives with the president that, that day. Um, generally, when a president goes on a vacation, um, uh, we leave him alone. We, we're not expecting uh, any great access to him. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to see what he's doing in his free time. We don't want to walk the golf course with him. We don't want to do any of that. This was true, this was going to be true for a long three-day weekend in Florida. Uh, until um, another, uh, we were staying at a hotel 10 miles away from where the president was uh, behind this gated compound, which also made us uncomfortable because we just didn't know much about the place where they were. Was he staying in a cottage? Was he staying in a, in a, in a hotel? How often uh, was he engaged with the public? Th these are security questions that we are curious about. And a lot of the reason we staff these trips where there isn't going to be access is in case something happens uh, and that, that, that we are there. Um, and so there, there are questions that do concern us. We don't, we, we don't ask questions that will obviously jeopardize the security, and we certainly don't report them. Um, but we did not know much about what was happening. Once a reporter um, outside of the pool, uh, to his credit, started reporting on the Tiger Woods uh, President Obama golf game, um, a, a reporter for Golf Digest and the Golf Channel, uh, the pool wanted access, uh, wanted the opportunity to take a picture of the President and Tiger walking up the 18th fairway. Um, and it became uh, as many things in Washington do, a much uh, bigger deal and, uh, than it actually was, and a l prolonged argument about something that was entirely beside the point. Uh, the point was um, about access uh, on trips like this uh, and, and when they're allowed. And it was also a statement that the White House Correspondents Association was trying to make at the start of a second term when presidents usually give even less access to the media than they did in a first, uh, that, um, that we would continue to try to be our own advocates um, for as much access to the president as possible. Uh, he did come back and chat with us at the end of that trip. Um, and uh, and I, I think I got a dig in at us saying uh, that he'd heard how neglected we all felt. Uh, and, um, but but that, the fight really was really much more about a point of principle moving forward um, that, uh, that, that when something is being made public and there is a travel pool along, uh, it should be mobilized at least for the opportunity to take uh, a, 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 our own an independent media a photograph or some document to, to mark that. That's what that was about. On, on senior uh, administration officials, um, we have a couple, uh, we have a, it, 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 the rules are um, change on who these officials might be. Um, if they are, uh, and I have to describe why they are remaining anonymous to the best of my ability in the story as well. Um, and uh, there are some who I've worked with for a long time uh, and, um, and, and, and feel like if they say something, the president is going to do something tomorrow, and I know that this person is with the president every day and advises the president every day, um, that can be enough uh, to write a story about. I've never been burned uh, on, on that front. But in terms of just working uh, with sources who are getting things second and third hand, um, uh, the rules are trying to get to it or, or, or three. But, but the larger rule is I have to be certain that what I'm saying is correct. Um, and even if you can get three people to say the same thing in Washington, doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> uh, so it's, um, it, it's, it's a bit of a work in progress. I've never been, been burned. I'm, I'm, I'm very cautious. Um, I would rather be late than wrong uh, every time. Um, uh, I am late uh, at times. Um, and uh, and I, 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 I'm deeply embarrassed when I make mistakes. And I'm, 
I, I tried my best not to. And um, the anonymous sourcing is is uh, is really more a, a disservice we do to readers um, more than anything else. And in our in our obligation to you is to try to tell you as much about them as we can without giving away who they are, um, how they might be in a position to know what they know, that kind of thing, without actually saying, here's who told, you know, here's who told me this. Does, does that help a bit? Thank you. Okay. Well, I hold out hope for you, my good friend, and here's why. <laughs> <laughs> Every day I get a neat uh, email from Barack Obama in my Gmail. And I don't read that crud. Because <laughs> I'm 55 years old and I see it for what it is, which is a superficial rendition of what's going on. And my question to you is, the young generation now that is weaned on Twitter, which I call a thousand canaries chirping at each other, not listening to anybody, they are going to eventually replicate the crowd in this room, a crowd that searches for greater depth and analytical reporting. So might there be an evolution back toward entities such as you that report in greater depth. Uh, there will be a new young generation that perhaps uh, likes Twitter, but these kids are going to get old. They're going to have responsibilities. They're going to have families. They're going to run and read something that's of substance, right. and they're not going to sit around on their phones. So given that evolution, do you see any sort of retro possibility for solid analytical reporting in the future I, or are we lost I, <laughs> I first I appreciate the the, the, the optimism thank you uh, it's always good to hear uh, I uh, there, there are two things I'd say I, I do think uh, and it's measurable uh, on the internet uh, original in-depth long-form investigative reporting still does extremely well on the internet. Still gets a lot of viewers, a lot of hits. Um, people stay on the site longer, which advertisers like. Uh, there's a business model to be built around just what you're describing. And there still is an appetite. Um, maybe more people our age, but, but also, uh, but, but certainly among young people too. And, and they'll, they'll, I think that they'll continue to want the kind of reporting um, that I like doing best and that you're describing. The, the threat is the short term uh, ability to um, basically to hold on, right? So what's happening now is we still have a printed, we have we, 600,000 copies of the Washington Post go out each day. 80% of our money, of our revenue, comes from those printed editions of the Washington Post. Fewer and fewer people are getting those. Our numbers on the internet are going up and up and up and up. That advertising is not nearly paying the, 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 there's still just too big a gap between what we're making and what we're not. Now we may go to some kind of paywall metered at some point, who knows? I don't know, maybe that'll make up some. Um, but it's, it's, getting, it's getting the right, I think our journalism still works. I think it's still a business model problem that we have yet to crack. And, um, and, and this kind of journalism, hiring uh, the kinds of people who can do it, um, Sending the place, sending them out to the places that where it needs to get done, um, is is extremely expensive. Um, you know, uh, the Huffington Post has made a has made a great success of of having everyone else pay for a lot of journalism that they're making a lot of money off of somehow. So more power to Ariana Huffington. Um, but but we don't do that. So the the long answer is yes. I agree with you. I think really good. New, uh, really good journalism still works, will still work on any, whether it's a mobile phone or the internet or anything else. Um, and there will still be great value in that. The problem is getting there. Uh, and the next 10 years will really determine um, uh, whether or not um, we, can, we can sort of do that. And I, I am incredibly fortunate to be working for uh, the Graham family. Uh, that cares deeply about the Washington Post and making it work, um, and uh, and is willing to do a lot to ensure that that happens. Um, so I'm 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 one of the lucky ones, but um, I'm I'm optimistic. I'm about where you are. <laughs> optimistic with some with some caveats. 
gentleman ahead of me took most of my question, but I'm going to try and put another shadow on some of your answers for another question. First, I want to thank you for an absolutely wonderful talk. I think your point about how this particular president utilizes the media was extremely well taken and very clear. That being said, I'm worried about right now, and I wonder if, in your opinion, over and above the suggestions you've just given about will this come back round again, if you can look in your crystal ball and think about what the next president might do. Might he take the same techniques? We talked about how effective negative advertising and campaigning has been. Or do you think that um, given not only the strategy that you're suggesting for how it might turn around, but that perhaps the next president might go back to some of the tried and true ways uh, in addition to the current media. And I, I just wonder if you could speak to that for a minute. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for your nice words also. Um, I, I think, um, I, I believe that this is a trend that, that, is, that is fairly inevitable moving in one direction. Um, and, and I think that um, it's uh, whether other presidents will be as, um, uh, as, as smart about it as President Obama has been and the people he has hired to be smart about it, uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, th you know, there, there was, 2008 gave us a bit of, a, 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 bit of a preview of what, a, what this might look like, what a campaign and what a way of governing uh, sort of in, in a way that essentially covers yourself looks like. And, um, and, and the Republican campaigns really, really didn't catch on to that in any meaningful way. Um, the, the, the Obama, um, uh, so, so I'm not, I think it will depend more on who's in office. Um, I think the goal will always want to be what, the pre what President Obama is, is, is in many ways perfecting, uh, whether they'll be as successful at executing it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, and, you know, for our, our job is, as, as you know, the, the independent, excuse me, the independent media, um, you know, we have to continue to be, um, you know, not only aggressive advocates for, for uh, you know, for access and, uh, and, and, and make our case through our, through our own credibility, uh, which we've had problems with this, la this last decade. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no sugarcoating the fact that, that, um, that the mainstream media has done itself damage in some of the, um, in, 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 in the run-up to the Iraq war, in, in holding uh, governments accountable, uh, in, in effectively examining um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the very murky and, and kind of uh, makeshift uh, rules of law around uh, the drone uh, program. Um, these are big questions, and they're, as a side note, ones we spend a lot more time fighting with the White House about than Tiger Woods, believe me. <laughs> um, and uh, so we have, to, we have to make ourselves relevant again. Um, and uh, and, and it's, it's more than just platforms, and it's more than just young versus old. It's, um, uh, you need to get up in the morning and read the Washington Post if you want to know what's going on. Uh, and, and, and I'm not saying we're doing that every day. So we have to get better too. And I, and I think between, the, you know, I think that will help convince future presidents uh, to say, well, you know, uh, I don't like an aggressive media, um, but, uh, but I'll talk to a media, but, but a credible media um, is something that, that does have value, uh, even, if, uh, even if there's tough questions involved. Um, and and I, I, I think we need to get better uh, as well. Thank you very much for coming. I found your speech to be uh, very riveting uh, for the obvious reasons, the worrisome, um, to mix metaphors, an echo bubble uh, that they're creating. And at this time, with this administration, as directed from the inside. Um, however, it did occur to me that in terms of mechanism and dynamics, uh, it's not a heck of a lot different than what Roger Ailes and uh, Faux News have been doing 
uh, for a couple of decades. And I say that because there's not a, little, not a lot of criti criticism of Republican administrations and Republican politicians from, from phone news. And just as one example, you mentioned NBC hiring David Axelrod. Uh, how long ago did, uh, was it that uh, Fox News hired uh, Carl Rove? And Sarah Palin, and yeah, yeah exactly. Um, no, I, I, think, I, I think you're right. It speaks to, it, it also speaks to the last answer I was trying to give, uh, which is, um, I, you know, I don't think that, that, the, that the national media does itself any favors by those, by, by blurring the lines in the way they're being blurred, by, by deciding for marketing, reason, marketing reasons to be the, uh, the left-wing answer to Fox News because they were successful, or uh, not only is it not great for the country for obvious reasons, um, given how gerry, you know, gerrymandered our congressional districts already are, and you can see the results of that in a, in a deadlocked Congress, um, but, but a country that continues to, to live in its own echo chambers and, and, and read and listen to things that reinforce uh, what they already believe um, is, not the, is not the job of the media. Um, and I, I, it gives me hope again that, that there will be uh, a move back, um, uh, it, it, maybe never in print again, maybe never in the place obviously where, where, where most of our money comes from, but, but we'll figure the internet out in terms of a business model. Um, but in the in the uh, in the in this in, in what is trying to be objective journalism, um, and you know, it's it's also one of those things you you hear a lot of. Uh, you hear people saying, "Boy, I really miss the days of objective journalism. I really miss the days of of the newspaper and the you know picking it up in the morning." And yet, in practice, uh, it doesn't always feel that way. The ratings for the partisan stuff and and uh, and again, a uh, you know a Sarah Palin column uh, will will get a lot of attention, uh, a lot of hits, uh, a lot of advertisers want to be around that. So um, you know there's there's market forces behind it. But I I agree with you. I th I think that it, that 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 regardless of of how esteemed and 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 uh, traditional and historic a place like NBC News is. I don't give, I don't think that does them any good by hiring someone like that. There was a long article in the New York Times Magazine this week uh, that essentially said, if I paraphrase correctly, I hope, uh, that one reason the Romney campaign lost was that they didn't appreciate the, uh, the social media communication skills that the Obama campaign did. I guess my question would be, is this the wave of the future? Uh, are all campaigns going, do you think, going to start talking over the heads of the media? And, um, and what would be the cure-all, for the corrective for that if it were to happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do. Um, and I think each race will determine the extent that that has to happen. Um, and we're such, a, we're such a narrowly divided country now that <coughs> Speaking directly to um, your supporters constantly um, is a strategy that, it, which is sort of the heart of the of the social media direct email. Uh, what you think? Uh, share it with a friend. Kind of approach that that uh, the Obama team was so good at. Um, if there's ever a race, if more states become purple. Uh, you may get a, uh, a that that kind of direct communication um, will be uh, less and less effective, um, and it's that's very effective in mobilizing supporters. It's not incredibly effective at winning over new converts. Um, uh, they the 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 idea of you know how the internet. The, the search, the, the shift from search to social on the internet, that is, used to search Obama and X issue, uh, now it's, it's shared. It's, hey, check out this article from your friend who just posted it on their Facebook page. That's the future. Uh, that's where it's going. So th there, is, uh, there are some ways to persuade 
uh, undecided voters um, that way using social media in the future and, 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 it, and it worked during this campaign to some degree. But the closer, um, the more up in the air, the more undecided races are, instead of five or six states deciding a national election. If 15 do, uh, I, think I think things start tilting back. I think uh, the direct sort of, the, you know, the direct communication works in less, less and less effectively, and the message has to become more and more national, more and more broad uh, um, uh, to be effective. So I think it'll depend on the race, but. Can you compare the importance of new media in Obama's campaign to the importance of the new media of TV to Kennedy's campaign? I, I probably can't, to be totally honest with you. I'd, I'd, I'd love to be uh, more expert. I mean, that, you know, we, we think of, I mean, it's funny in some ways you could almost make, you could almost make an argument that, that uh, um, when you think of Kennedy and you think of the debate and what television did that night, and then you think of Obama and his first debate uh, and, and how he did not perform his best, um, in some ways that felt you know, very traditional, I suppose. Uh, uh, one big night on TV for, for both men um, having different effects. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I, I don't quite, my, my, the only point I would make is um, just the, the broadcast nature of a television audience versus the extremely uh, tailored um, messaging of, uh, of, what, of what Obama uh, and his team uh, think about in terms of social media and new media is, is, is quite different. But, um, uh, and, and, and again, if we get back to races where 15 states are in play, TV may, be, may become again, national TV, national newspapers may again become a much more important tool than uh, the sort of precinct by precinct, household by household marketing stuff that's taking place now. I hope that helps. I wish I were more expert on that. Um, so thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. I wanted to um, start by saying that I was a volunteer in um, the Illinois state headquarters for the Obama campaign, and I can attest to the fact that we were practically forbidden from speaking to the press. And um, <laughs> when we did, it was very strict talking points. So um, I um, could connect with that. Um, my question is, I would like you to talk a little bit about what you see the role of organizing for action playing. Um, throughout this term, and also um, if you could talk a little bit, I know from the emails that I've been getting from the organization that this time, unlike the campaign, they're, even though it's the same people, they're really encouraging us to reach out to the press in any way that we can. So if you can talk about that a little bit as well. It's, it's a really good question. It'll be something that, that we're going to spend a lot of time watching and writing about. Uh, um, I had lunch with, with one of the board members of Organizing for Action the other day, and one of the, one of the, the macro interesting things he said was the conventional wisdom is a second term president has about two years to get a domestic agenda in place before he kind of lapses into lame duck status, two years at the outside. They are hoping to use Organizing for Action to extend that period, mm -hmm. to be able to say, um, uh, we, have, we still have a national, um, a, a very effective national campaign network uh, that's out there working on behalf of the president's agenda and the candidates that the president, that are supporting the president's agenda. Uh, and, and so they believe they can be viable, that, that the president's ability to, to, to achieve his goals in Washington can be viable right up until the time he leaves office. I, I, it's, it's, that'll be a test. We'll see if that's true or not. Um, but that's one way they're looking at it on a, on a strategic level. Uh, on a practical level, I know they're raising a lot of money. And um, they are going to be, you know, you've already seen uh, some of the emails about, about gun control, about immigration. Um, some of the personal testimonials they're beginning to send out. Um, 
But I had an interesting talk with uh, John Podesta, sort of sometimes advisor to Obama, runs the Center for American Progress, very, very smart man, who said he hopes it doesn't become an organization that just assigns lobbying tasks to volunteers, that, that you don't get an email saying, hey, show up for the big rally on immigration on Saturday. We need all the organizing for action people out there. He wants to become much more, and this is really the way Obama thinks about uh, the, the country and democracy as a conversation, uh, to get involved in issues at every level uh, in support of, of this broader, uh, the president's broader stated push of trying to, to close the income gap, the opportunity gap, those things that he's talking about. So that would mean getting involved in state initiatives, in local initiatives, um, uh, going to city council meetings on minimum wage, on the minimum wage, really um, becoming an organization that is, that is political at all levels. Uh, now, broadly in support of the agenda that the president is involved in. Uh, that, that, the, that the president is, is pushing, but, but really not at a level of, let's have a couple of rallies every now and then, and let's target a member of Congress and make his life miserable for a bit until we get his vote. They want it to be a much more broader-based effort than that. Um, again, I, I mean, after a billion-dollar campaign and they're already asking people for more money, uh, you know, I, it might take some while to, to open up their wallets again. But, but their ambitions are big for it, um, and much bigger than uh, let's mobilize around health, you know, let's mobilize around immigration. They left it dormant for two years, the first two years of, uh, of, of the president's term, when um, they could have really been, you know, gearing it up. They brought it in very late to secure health care legislation. Um, they're hoping to get off to a much faster start and really use it in a much kind of broader way and extend beyond this two years what, what the president might be able to do with Congress. But it'll be, that, that, that's a new feature. That's something that we hope to be able to write well about. So congratulations on your award and uh, thank, you. thank you for a compelling talk. I think the talk is a little linear. In fact, the, the description of the Obama White House as a juggernaut using all these social media is at variance with the results. In 2010, they fell on their face. There was a negligible turnout. They were killed in the Congress. Their issues were turned around and distorted. Uh, it was a pathetic performance, I would say, by that team that you just lauded. In 2012, it wasn't much better the first half of the year. The predict predictions were that turnout among the youth would be poor. The uh, Republicans were gloating that they had the election in the bag. And it was only with a big push toward the end and many missteps on the other side that the election was a success for Obama. So I just challenge you a little bit to think about that. And, and one further comment on a different matter is the Post, I believe, has made very good use of independent investigative journalism. Most of the big papers have given up their staffs on investigative journalism of most types. But ProPublica, the Center for Public Integrity, the Charles Eisendrath at uh, this university, and I happen to serve on the latter board. And we're proud of the work they do. But it, all they usually get is a byline on the front page or some other page of the Post for a really good, hard-hitting, data-rich story that enables the Post to take on some important issues that they don't manage to address themselves. Uh, a couple of things. The, uh, on the, the last first, I, I agree ProPublica has a wonderful organization. But I mean, we, we, we have a huge investigative staff. I'm not sure where you uh, got that we've cut our investigative reporting. We have, it, it's got to be 30 people on our investigative staff. Uh, and, but we do work with ProPublica and have done some really good work with ProPublica and they're an outstanding and, and a new model that, that I hope really works and takes off. Uh, I, would, I, I would fundamentally challenge your account of the 2012 election. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was not a late surge by Obama that won. Um, it, it, it's, we can talk a little bit, maybe we can chat about it briefly afterward, but, uh, um, but your first point, I think, is a, really, uh, is, is a really smart one. Why, if they're so good at going around the national media, 
have they not been more successful in, in securing their legislative agenda? Even when they controlled Congress, it was, it was tough. And, and I, think, I think that's, um, I, I've written a couple of stories about that already since the, uh, since the inauguration. Um, it's, it's still a matter of a president who sees uh, his strengths uh, and what it means to, to lead, largely in terms of, of, of speaking to the country um, at large through, through sometimes big speeches, sometimes more regional speeches, but, but, but in talking, in, in, um, in communicating directly. Uh, he does not, as, as I noted in the talk, he, he does not, and, and I'm not sure is showing signs of improving uh, his inside game in Washington. Um, how does this president use power is a question I'm constantly asking myself and trying to get the answer to, and not always uh, very successfully. Because there is, there is a big gap between the at times effectiveness as a communicator of a message and a vision for the country that pull, and I'm basing this on polling, and his inability then to see that through. Um, and and I, I think you've put your finger precisely on the challenge facing him in the second term. Uh, and I, I, just two days ago, that was the, basically the thesis of the story I wrote, which is how, how do you bring those two things together? How do you lay out and a, a, an agenda that he did in the State of the Union, um, and yet, uh, and 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 it's going to require Congress, um, and uh, and and not change the way you've done things, um, unless a lot of the markers that he's laying out, as just as FDR did in his second Bill of Rights speech, he knew was going nowhere, um, to 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 get a new Congress. Um, it, to, to make the 2014 midterms uh, an extremely important part of how he sees his second term in order to secure some of these, some of these items. So I, I, think you've, I think you've identified these, the central challenge and the, the, incong the in incongruous nature of really good at this stuff, but why not more in Washington? Last question. My question, I think, has quite a bit to do, uh, I think you just answered part of it. It's really a speculation question, because it seems to me you're talking about a lot of electronic and fancy smoke and mirrors to reach the message, to make the message go out and, and get something back and get people stirred up. And we had a previous author, an expert, who told us all the differences that were used in terms of monitoring the election and getting the vote out and so forth. But all of that has to do with getting elected. He's been elected. If he stays within the Constitution, uh, he's only got the next couple of years. Uh, what is his game? What does he gain? What is he trying to gain for the country by using this mechanism to reflect himself in so many mirrors mm -hmm. and the way he wants people to see him and his message. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. is the message? What is his game? Well, it's, it, it, it does get to this, and it does also get to organizing for action. Um, uh, can they this time, which they did not do last time, uh, turn uh, this um, extremely effective uh, um, ground game, to what purpose? That's right, to, to 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 pass legislation in Congress, to run, to 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 run in congressional, yeah, to run in. Con I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, there's a person personal connection in politics. Politics has always been two things. It's always been issues and candidates, and. Uh, that's where we're getting, I'm getting lost in trying to track what all of this, I call it electronic smoke and mirrors. And I have a son on a fairly high level with NBC in the West Coast, and I understand that the TV, they're having the, the same kinds of problems that you're talking about, because that's what journalism is all about. It's a safeguard, and it's being circumvented. 
totally, uh, both the electronic media and the um, print media. Uh, where are where is he going with this? Right. That's so, okay. So again, if you, let, let's let's pretend that instead of Barack Obama running for re-election, uh, immigration reform uh, is running for re-election, you mobilize uh, in, instead of letting lapse. Uh, your, your campaign organization that you did last time, this database that's been enriched with all of this marketing data and who's where and who's doing what, you begin to use that immediately to campaign on behalf of immigration. How do you do that? You go to congressional districts where they're not either dark red or dark blue and you begin to run moderates, you fund and campaign for moderates in those districts, you change Congress in those di districts that support your positions. Uh, you get the president um, out much more aggressively in those kinds of districts talking. Uh, you might even encourage moderate Republicans uh, to run uh, against uh, conservative ones. Um, you, try, you try to change the dynamic in Congress and, it's, and it won't be easy, it may be utterly impossible, but that is what he's trying to do with, with and, and, and supporting all this, is this constant conversation, uh, bombardment, whatever you want to call it, of email and Twitter and YouTube and local television interviews, um, talking specifically to voters in those districts where those Congre members of Congress are going to be decisive on some of these issues. And do you find evidence that the, this whole system is being used for negative purposes as well? Uh, Personal attacks, oh, sure. attacks. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, the campaign was nasty, wasn't it? It, it, uh, <laughs> it, 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 will, it will resemble, it will resemble uh, the campaign at times. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much all for coming. I told you it would be an interesting talk, and it was, and you've had really wonderful questions, and you'll have time for more questions as long as our guest will abide us out in, in the lobby. Uh, to thank you for your first visit to a presidential library, we are providing you with a set of pens with Gerald Ford's wonderful. signature on them to use when you write your book about the Obama administration and you come back one more time. Thank you very much. <laughs> I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.